So you ask the question that isn't it injustice when the right of divorce is only given to the man and not to the woman? If you realize the way Islamic marriage takes place, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as Allah says in the Quran, it's mentioned in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 40. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is never unjust in the least degree. And the Quran says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 228, that the women have rights as against them, on terms equitable, but the men have a degree of advantage. So overall, the Quran says the men and women are equal, but some places they have a degree of advantage. And on the other hand, there are hadiths which the Prophet said that have respect the mother more. So the, the women have a degree of advantage. But this aspect, why do the men have a degree of advantage? The reason is that when a marriage takes place, one of the criteria besides the agreement of both the would-be husband and wife, there is a concept of meher. That it's compulsory, as the Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 4, that give to the economic status. That means meher is compulsory for a marriage to solemnize. So when a mahar is given, the would-be wife can demand what she wants. And the Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse 20, you can even give a mountain of gold. So imagine when a marriage takes place, it is the man who is in loss economically. He gives mahar. Now once he gives the mahar, if suppose the right is given to the woman to divorce, and she divorces, who would be the loser? Who would be the man? And in case if a divorce takes place, the girl can marry again. When she marries, she gets a new mare. Here, if the man marries, he has to give a new mare. So therefore, economically, the woman is secured. So based on this, generally by default, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the right to the man to divorce. And furthermore, the Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse number 34, Ar-Rujalu kawamun ala nisa that the men are the supporters of the women. For Allah has given one strength more than the other. So based on this, because man is a kawam, he is the leader in the family. But naturally, by default, the right to divorce goes to the man. Because he is the one who looks after the family, etc. But that does not mean a woman cannot demand the rights. During Nikah Nama, if she wishes, she can put a condition that I too want a right to divorce. Because by default it goes to the man, but if the husband wants to give that right even to the would-be wife, he can give. So in the Nikanama, if the woman wants, if the would-be wife wants to put a condition, and if the husband agrees, she can put a condition, so both will have the right. But otherwise, by default, without any rules and regulation, the right goes to the man. Otherwise, I'll have to give a talk on men's rights in Islam. Hope that answers the question, sister. Any other sister has any questions? Assalamualaikum. Wa alaikum Is it encouraged to marry within the same community like Kokhmis marry only Kokhmis? Sister has a question that is it encouraged for a girl or a boy to marry within the same community like Kokhni marrying Kokhni or Meman marrying Meman? We only got stuck to Kokhni because I'm a Kokhni. So it can go Sheikh marrying a Sheikh or a Sayyid marrying a Sayyid. So realize the beloved Prophet Muhammad said it's preferable to marry the same type of people, same category, whether it may be in category in terms of ethnicity, whether it may be in terms of economic status, whether it be in terms of community, because the compatibility is there. Because the Kokhni have a different style of living, the Mimin have a different style of living, the Keralite may have a different style of living, the person, UK American person have a different style of living, the European may have. So it's easy to gel. So it is preferable but not a fard. Similarly, imagine an African marrying a European. It can go well, not it's not possible. It's possible, but the chances of compatibility is less. Similarly, Chinese coming and marrying someone from Kerala. Not that it's not possible, it's possible, but if you want to break this barrier for a cause, for example, I am finding a more virtuous non kokni then I prefer marrying a non kokni than marrying a kokni. For in my case, I could not live outside kokni. I could not get a girl from Bombay who I wanted to work chase. So I had to go to Pune. I had to travel 160 miles. So I not only left the community, I left the city also. So your reason to marry was virtue. 
So if virtue is the criteria, if you break these barriers of economic status, of nobility, of community, of ethnicity, there's no problem. Otherwise, generally, if exactly same, same virtues, who is from your community, not from your community, preferable, same virtues from your community. Same virtues who's rich and who's poor, and if you're rich, then same virtues who's rich is preferable. But if you find that one person more virtuous and out of the community is preferable, that one person is more important than matching your community or matching your ethnicity or matching your economic status. But if the virtue is not the criteria, otherwise marrying in the same level is preferable, so that life becomes easier. So when you have a choice to choose the easy part, it's preferable to choose the easy part than the difficult. But that does not mean, because normally in Indian culture it's very common. Kokni should marry a Kokni, 99%. Mehman should marry Mehman. A Kerala Malayali should marry a Malayali. And that's the reason, you know, they look for this criteria more important than virtue. Yes, I want virtue, but should be a Kokni. I want a virtuous girl, but should be a Mehman. So this is just for saying they are more looking for their community rather than virtue. So virtue should be given the most important. Hope that answers the questions. Are there any other questions? Is it cultural or is it promoted in Islam to give preference to younger women for marriage or to give preference to virgin over non-virgins or to give preference over good looking to average looking women? Sister has the question that is it cultural in Islam, is it preferable in Islam to marry younger women as compared to elder women, to marry more beautiful women as compared to average looking women, or more wealthier than poor, is it preferable? It is mubah. Because if you go to the history of Muhammad the first woman that Muhammad married, Hazrat Khatija Mella Bipitita, she was 15 years elder to the Prophet. The Prophet was 25 years old, Hayat Khatija was 40 years old. And later on, he had only one wife, till the age of 50, 52, until Hazrat Khatija may life be that she expired. And only after she expired did the Prophet marry. And after that when he married, he married the girls that were younger, 36 years old, 32 years old, etc. But preference over young and age, here you have an example, the first marriage is 15 years older, the next marriage is younger. You have an example that the Prophet, the first wife he did, Hazrat Khadija Mela, she was a widower, so she wasn't a virgin. Amongst all the wives, only one wife was virgin. And then all the others, they were not virgins. They were either widower or they were divorcees. But that does not mean it is sunnah to marry a non-virgin, then there will be a problem. But in the life of the Prophet, the Prophet gave various examples. Rich, her Khadija Mella, she was very rich. The other ladies that the Prophet married, some were poor. So Prophet had an example of rich women, he married poor women, elderly women, younger women, virgin, non-virgin, more were divorcees, and they were widows. So here you find that classic, according to me, it's Muba. But it's a personal choice, as the Prophet said, as I mentioned earlier. According to the Hadith of Sahih Bukhari, one number seven in the book of Nikah, Hadith number 5090, that the beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, that when a person marries, he looks for four things, beauty, wealth, nobility, and virtue. And amongst them, virtue is the best. So if someone looks for beauty, it's not haram. Someone wants a younger wife, it's not haram. Someone wants a wealthier wife, it's not haram. Someone wants a noble wife, it's not haram. But amongst them, virtue is the best. So more important is the virtue, if you find a virtuous wife and she is less beautiful, it is preferable to marry a less beautiful wife than who is less virtuous. So virtuous wife who is less beautiful is preferable than more beautiful and less virtuous. So all these things, virtue carries more weight. But Islamic, there is nothing like which is preferable in the other criteria. As far as virtuous is concerned, it is preferable for sure. Hope that answers the questions. Are there any other sisters that have any questions? Assalamu alaikum. What is the duty of the daughter to her parents after marriage? Should she obey them or her husband? This is the question that what is the duty of a daughter to her parents after she married? Should she obey the husband or the parents? I feel she should obey both. The best is obey both. But if there is a conflict, who is more important? But naturally before marriage, obeying the parents is most important. After marriage also it's important, but once she gets married, she goes to a different family. 
So if there is a conflict between both, we have to see that who is more on the Quran and Sunnah. Is it the husband or is it her parents? So based on that, she makes the decision. But if both are neutral, both are not against the Quran and Sunnah, then you try and convince either of them that to change their views so that you can follow both the parents and satisfy your husband. But if there is really a conflict and both are not against Quran and Sunnah and yet, so but naturally the tilt goes more towards your husband after marriage. Little bit more because you have a family to look after, but that does not mean you neglect your parents, you disobey your parents. Only if the conflict is such that both are on the Quran and Sunnah and then you have to choose between one of them. So it's preferable you satisfy both. As a last resort, if you have to take a balance, but now the balance tilts more towards the husband because he becomes your immediate family, not that your parents are not. But at the same time, if you can convince your husband and yet obey your parents, that is the best. Hope that answers the question. Any sister, have any questions? Assalamualaikum. Waalaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Why is the Ida period after the death of a husband is longer than the Ida period after the divorce? Sister has a question that why is the Ida period after the death of a husband longer as compared to the Ida period after the divorce? In both the Ida, as the Quran says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 228, that when you divorce your wife, there is a Iddah period of three menstrual cycle or three monthly periods. But when a person dies, the Quran says that after your husband expires, the Iddah period is for four months, ten days. So the Iddah period after her husband expires is one month, ten days longer. For divorce, it's three months. For after death, it's four months, ten days. Why? The reason the Iddah period is there, for various reasons, one of the major reasons after divorce that the Iddah period is there to come to know whether the wife is carrying the child of the husband. So if during the Iddah period, there are various reasons. One reason is it's more for preliminary test, as I said, that can the husband or wife stay away from each other. So it's a temporary period. In two weeks, you come to know, I thought we were angry with my wife because she doesn't hand my clothes. And I feel that let's stay away. And now I realize in two weeks time, I'm in a more difficult situation. Let's patch up. Let's reconciliate. Or the wife may think I'm getting angry, you know, that my husband gives me less time, he only gives me five hours a day. And now in two weeks I realize that even if you give me two hours, no problem. You know, something is better than nothing. So they can patch up. So various reasons are there. But one of the other reasons is that to come to know whether the wife is carrying the child of the husband. So if she's carrying, it extends, it the pair extends to the time of delivery. And furthermore, no one should allege that if they part and in three months time, you can easily come to know without doing any medical test that is she carrying a child or not. In the olden days, there were no examination like what we have, ultrasonography, amniocentesis, where is pregnancy test, amniocentesis for sex determination, we don't have the pregnancy test like we have today. But pregnancy is not the only reason, but at that time, Three months is sufficient to come to know whether the woman is carrying the child of the husband or not. Pregnancy is not the only criteria, one of the important criteria. Besides that, as I said, that can you stay away, etc., it's a preliminary period. But in case of the death of a husband, when divorce takes place, everything is planned. Planned means divorce doesn't take place suddenly. First, there's mutual consultation between husband and wife, if you go according to the correct sunnah. If you go to the wrong bidha style, talak, 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 then it may take place in a second. You get angry and it starts, which is not Islamic at all. It's talak bidha, as I discussed last time. If you go to the Islamic procedure of talak, first there is mutual consultation between husband and wife. Then if it cannot be solved, then you appoint an arbiter. Then you wait. Then where is it? Then normally divorce takes place. It takes weeks and months. Sometimes even year. So it is planned and you know something is going on. And then there is the period for three months. Compared to in a case of husband dying, most of the time it's sudden death, maybe an accident, maybe as a disease. Some rare cases he is terminally ill and you know he's dying slowly, but the chances are less. So most of the time in death you don't expect the husband to die. So here the wife is in a state of mental shock. So besides coming to know whether she's carrying a child in which three months is sufficient, so no one lays an allegation on her that she has a little set sex nose billa with some man and after the husband has died she is carrying a child of someone else so in that period 
they have period to know whether she is carrying the child. One of the reasons. But why is it one month, ten days more? Because when the woman undergoes a sudden loss, a shock, that she does not have a husband, this time is given for her to settle down. That's the reason during the that she cannot make any contract to marry someone else. And if she makes, it's not valid. After the idda is over, because you know maybe she is in a state of shock and someone says I want to marry, she says she is not secured, she is very scared and she may agree to marry someone who is not good also. So the idda period is extended. The so 4 months, 10 days is sufficient to let the mental shock come down for the woman to come in normal state so that she can take the decision to remarry. So it's a longer idda, longer waiting period and she can take a much wiser decision whether she has to marry again, who she chooses, etc. That's the reason for the idda after death of husband is longer as compared to divorce. Hope that answers the question, sister. Any other gents have any questions? Any brothers? Oh, mashallah, Arshi. Assalamu alaikum. So I've considered a wife. Walaikum salam. Um, many young men today, they give priority to their careers uh, as opposed to getting married uh, soon. So they wait till they're in their mid 30s or 40s. Uh, and uh, they wait too long to get married. So is there any specific thing on this that you may shed some light? I would question that many a time today the youngsters, they give more preference to the career rather than marriage and they say, I want to make my career. I have to stand on my hands. So I said, why are you the teenager also can stand on your feet? You know, the other says, I want to stand on my own feet. That means I want to actually be financially independent. That's what they mean. They want to be a doctor or engineer or start doing a good job where they earn. So normally by the time they are settled and good job, it becomes past 30s or late 20s. That's also very early. Past 30s or mid 30s, early 30s. So how important is it to establish your career before you get married? See, marriage is part of life and career is also part of life. I feel a person should not delay the marriage just because of a career. Or even for education. Fine. I am not saying that he should get married in his teens. If he maturely wants, he can. Islam gives permission once a person has reached puberty. He or she can. But don't delay too much. As the beloved Prophet Muhammad said. Mashin Sahih Bukhari, one number seven. In the book of Niqah. Chapter number three, hadith number four. That, oh young people, whoever has the means to get married, they should get married. Help to lower your gaze and guard your modesty also. These people normally delay thinking, you know, what they think that, you know, once I marry, then for me to look after my wife will be an obstruction in my studies, would be an obstruction in establish my career. In fact, it is wrong. Imagine if a person is doing medical studies, if he's married, the wife will help him. So if you look at the positive side, if you marry and then appear for a post-graduation, it's easy, you know, she'll help you. She'll help you make notes if required. She may help you see to the moment comfortable. Normally you only have your mother, now you have a mother and wife both too. So if you have a career, so what's the problem? Here yes, there's a fear that if I know only when I earn myself. Therefore the Prophet said, if you have the means. So most of these people who talk, the parents are already rich. They already have a good saving. So if finance is not the problem, I feel they should get married. And then establishing the business is easier. The wife can support you. Because wife, as I mentioned, is the role of garments. So I disagree with the concept that you marry late. Because if you marry early, then you'll have a children also early. And some people say, oh no, I want to relax, I want to relax, you know. Even if you have to relax, marry early. You marry in your early 20s. Have children. Fast. By the time you're 40, your child is already 18, 19. So you can sit on a business, you can retire. Before you reach 40. And then you wait till 60. So if you want to enjoy life also, marry early, have children, have your children take care of your business, so you can be free and you can relax earlier. So even to enjoy life, it is better you marry early. And one more thing, you don't go to the evil of society. Because when you are young, there are high chances you can be deviated. High chances that when you do your graduation and post-graduation, for you to be on the Sirat al-Mustaqim is difficult. If you have a wife, she is your Mohsena, she is the fortress against the devil, and more chances that you can concentrate on your studies. When you go to school, normally in co-ed schools and colleges, they say you spend more time in trying to be a hero in front of the opposite sex than doing studies. 
So now you already have a heroine with you. You already have a wife with you, so you, you won't waste your time otherwise, and it will help you to concentrate on your studies better. So I feel even if you have to study or look after a career, it's better that you get married earlier. Hope that answers the question. Any such have any questions? I'll come back to you. Any such have any questions? Yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Are marriages between cousins encouraged as scientifically it's proved that the children of the uh, couples they have genetic defects? Sister has the question that marrying among first cousins has proven it, it causes genetic problems. What she is referring to is consanguineous marriages. That in consanguineous marriages where the close blood relatives cousin is married, as far as the Quran is concerned, Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 23, 24, 25, it gives the people you cannot marry. The Quran says you cannot marry your mother. You cannot marry the woman who your father has married. You cannot marry the sister of your father. You cannot marry the sister of your mother. You cannot marry your own sister. You cannot marry your daughter. And the list is given. But in this list, the first cousin aren't mentioned. So based on this verse of the Quran, among the prohibited marriages, the Quran it does not prohibit you to marry your first cousins. But direct blood relations, the Quran prohibits. But today scientific research says that if you marry your blood relation, direct blood relation, brother and sister, mother and son, father and daughter, then there are high chances, very high chances of having genetic problems. Furthermore, even if you marry among the first cousins, the chances are there, but the chances are less. Even if you marry someone who is unknown to you, Yet the chances are there, but it is very negligible. But if you marry amongst the first cousin, the chances are not the same as you marry your direct blood relationship, brother and sister. But if you marry the first cousin, chances are more than marrying an unknown person. But compared to direct blood, brother and sister, it is negligible. What the scientific research says today, that continuously if you marry amongst the cousins, the mother and father are cousins, their children marry their cousins, their children marry their cousins. This is common in some of the communities. Like if you go to Tamil Nadu, there are some communities which have a concept of only marrying amongst the cousins. So then generation after generation, if you do, there are high chances of having these genetic problems. Otherwise, normally, once if you marry or twice, it is negligible. Continuously, so it's more of cultural based rather than Islam. And it's not a sunnah in Islam to marry your first cousin. It is mubah. It's optional. And since marrying once, once only, has hardly any negligible impact, but continuously generation after generation, generation after generation, there's a problem. And there is a hadith which was quoted by Ahmad Sakhar. He said that, one hadith he quoted that the Prophet has not encouraged marrying first cousin to generation after generation. Hope that answers the question. Any other sisters have any questions? Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Is there more reward and blessing to arrange for nikah on Fridays? Is there more reward and blessing, blessing. When, when you arrange the nikah on Fridays? Fridays, yes. As far as my knowledge goes, I don't know of any verse in the Quran. I don't know of any hadith which says that when you marry on Friday, you get more reward. You get, I don't know of any hadith. I don't know of any Quranic verse. But natural, but it's permissible. It's not haram also to get married on a Friday. I feel it's mubah. You can get married on Friday. Friday is the weekly Eid as we say. So no problem if you choose a Friday. But there's no sunnah of the Prophet that is recommended that you marry on a Friday. But Friday is the weekly Eid. If you get married, there's no problem at all. It's good, Alhamdulillah. But there is no particular hadith or a Quranic verse saying that it's preferable or you get more reward. Hope that's the question. Any other sisters have any questions? Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. The Prophet wasalam, has mentioned that majority in the hellfire will be women because they are uh, ungrateful to their husbands. But today we see that most of the men are committing so many crimes. I mean, rapes and um, murders and so many other crimes. So then, please explain. Yeah, even alcohol. Please explain. This has a question that the Prophet said that majority of the people in hell would be women. And one of the reasons is that they are ungrateful to their husbands. Sister asked the question that today you find men committing murder, committing rape, having alcohol. So, what about them? If you analyze sister today in the world, as I mentioned in my earlier answer on polygyny, 
that there are more women in the world than men. Even if you take for granted, or just as a normal mathematical equation, that equal percentage of men will go to hell as compared to the women, and equal percentage of men and women would go to heaven, and equal percentage to hell, because women are more in this world, in hell also there will be more. But that means in heaven there will be more, inshallah. You know, because, again, there is a hadith the Prophet said, that for every man, there will be multiple hood. So in that logical also equation, the woman would be more in heaven also. So don't get so much dejected. Look at the better side of it. And one of the reasons that the Prophet said, women would go to hell, one of the major reasons is, that because they are ungrateful to their husbands. What is the major reason that men will go is not mentioned. Fine, it may be murder, I don't know, but I doubt it will be murder. But all the men are not committing murder. So that doesn't mean that men will not go to hell. But one of the major reasons why women will go to hell is because they are ungrateful to their husbands. And that you see nowadays, you do find women try to be independent. They try to be, you know, because they are going away from Quran and Sunnah. So the hadith is correct. But that does not mean that men will not go to hell. And the women will not be in majority in the heaven. Hope that answers the question. If a husband is irresponsible and does not take care of the family and of the needs of the family, and he also does not provide education for the children. In such a situation, what should a wife do? If the husband does not take care of the family, does not look after, does not give the rights, the economic rights, does not take care of the children, so in this case, what should the wife do? The wife should try and convince the husband to look after the family. That's the first thing. Well, she's the Mosena, she's the fortress against the devil. And there's a normal problem that we have normally that the wives keep on complaining about the husband and the husband keeps on complaining about the wife and this is a common thing everywhere. It is more of a relationship of hand and glove as I mentioned. So maybe the wife should have an introspection that maybe if she is more close to the husband, if she is more loving to the husband, maybe the husband will take more care. So many a time tali dua se bachti hai. You clap with two hands, you can't clap with one hand. But normally everyone points the finger at others. When they point the finger at others, they fail to realize three fingers are pointing to themselves. So it's not always black and white. Husband and fault, wife and fault. Many a times it's the fault of both. So when a problem arises in a family, it's many a time the problem between both. And even if one of them is Islamic and follows the Quran and Sunnah and has sabr, inshallah most of the problems will be solved. Problem is there, that means both are not following Quran Sunnah properly. If both of them have sabr, both of them follow Quran Sunnah, either they change the other spouse and they prevent any problem taking place. But in such a situation, the wife should try and counsel the husband, be good to him. But if he continues, then she should try and help the husband look after the family. It's not bad. And depending upon how much is he not giving the rights? Is he torturing the wife? Is he beating the wife? Depending on the extent where she cannot bear, then she takes the decision whether she continues or she parts. That's her decision. Hope that answers the question. Are there any brothers have any questions? Mashallah, I want to say one thing that uh, Alhamdulillah, the effect of this program has already started. Shams is telling me that he wants to get married. <laughs> Mashallah, very good. Alhamdulillah. Uh, my question is that, uh, as she said so that... You have uh, a virtuous bachelor. Are you earning more than 4,000 rupees? <laughs> yes. Oh, mashallah, good. <laughs> <laughs> as uh, Brother Aishi said that, uh, there are uh, some youngsters who, uh, because of uh, their career, they reject marriages. Uh, I want to ask that there are some women who delay their motherhood because of their careers, although it may be Islamic, they may, they may want to be adaya or whatsoever it may be, but they delay their motherhood. So is this permissible in Islam? Before I answer your question, I'd like to ask you that, has this program had an effect on you? Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. Had an effect on your person sitting next to you, but on you, did it have an effect? Alhamdulillah. MashaAllah, when are you getting married? Inshallah. How soon? After I consulted with you. After? Inshallah. After you consulted with me? Yeah. My consultation as soon as possible. <laughs> do all if possible, I don't do all too early. Next month. Next year. Next year! <laughs> <laughs> See, this is the problem. You say you consult me, and then I give you advice and you delay it. So if you get the good wife, then why not next month? If not, then inshallah, next month. Inshallah, inshallah. Inshallah. Fine, that's good. Uh, as far as coming to your question, 
that the earlier question was that people want to delay marriage because they want to make a career etc but some of the ladies want to delay the motherhood they don't want to give birth to a child because they want to maintain the career etc is it correct i feel this is totally wrong why because the amount of sawab that a lady gets by being a mother is phenomenal and our beloved prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said it's mentioned in the hadith of sahih bukhari from number 8 in the book of adab chapter number 2 hadith number 2 A person came to the Prophet and asked him that who deserves the maximum love and companionship in this world? The Prophet said, "Your mother." The man asked after that too. The Prophet said, "Your mother." The man asked after that too. Again, the Prophet said, "Your mother." The man asked after that too. Then the Prophet said, "Your father." That means three fourth, seventy five percent of the love and companionship goes to the mother. Twenty five percent, one fourth goes to the father. In short, the mother gets the gold medal, she gets the silver medal, as well as the bronze medal. The father has to be satisfied with the mere consolation prize. So the amount of respect, the amount of sabab, the blessings that a woman gets in becoming a mother is phenomenal. Nine months that your mother has borne you in the womb, even if you give a mountain of gold, you cannot compensate. Even if you give the wealth of this world, you cannot compensate. So now, if someone wants to sacrifice the motherhood for earning maybe a few dollars more or a few thousand dollars more. I feel she is a very poor businesswoman. The good businesswoman will say that fine, this she is losing more. To earn little bit, she is losing more. So I disagree with the concept of delaying motherhood, either for having a better education or a better career, etc. I feel she should marry, she should have children, and then whatever happens, it should continue in that same process of life. Hope that answers the question. Any sister, have any questions? Uh, like brother mentioned about the guys having the problem of career. Boys. No, so then what about 